Well, thank you, Dr. Wright. We're certainly getting some very useful insight into the uses of estrogens, progesterones, and testosterone in, in women. But I know that your team, you and your team, have unearthed some very interesting information about iodine and uh, also cobalt. Would you, would you like to comment on how they might be uh, integrated into this kind of program? Yes, yeah, sure. And just before I do, you mentioned estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. And we mustn't forget when we're doing hormone replacement, there is a place for DHEA uh, yes. and thyroid yes. and melatonin and who knows, even growth hormone. Mm -hmm. That you'll need to talk, we'll need to talk to our doctors about, won't yes. we? Yes. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Well, you'd mentioned iodine and cobalt. Um, turns out that both of them have a lot to do with the metabolism of estrogen, particularly. Mm -hmm. And all the metabolism means is all the changes the hormone goes through while it's being used and then before and uh, being excreted from mm -hmm. the body because all are there. Uh, when we're younger, they're made and they're excreted, and they're made and they're excreted. And when we're older, the blood does the same thing. It gets rid of a proportion of every day. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it turns out that that very important anti-carcinogenic estrogen called estriol mm -hmm. is very dependent on the body having sufficient iodine mm -hmm. for it to be synthesized. It's actually naturally synthesized but from a precursor hormone called estrone, mm -hmm. which is another one of the procarcinogenic hormones. Mm -hmm. Well, if there's sufficient iodine present, the estrone will go through its steps, and out the other end will come estriol, and we now have a lot of this anti-carcinogen. But if there's not enough iodine, uh, that won't happen. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, actually a woman is at more risk for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So the iodine needs to be there in, in sufficient quantities. Now, many folks, can get that amount of iodine from uh, putting uh, kelp on their food or mm -hmm. eating seaweed. Mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese diet's full of seaweed and mm -hmm. that's good. Um, but there are a few women who actually have to take supplemental iodine mm -hmm. in order to get their bodies to metabolize the estrone to the estriol. In other words, to reduce the amount of procarcinogen and come out with more anti-carcinogen. Um, that's something that I just tripped over accidentally in treating uh, working with women to treat fibrocystic breast disease. Mm -hmm. um, that treatment I learned from a Dr. John Myers, by the way. It's not original with me. Mm -hmm. Dr. Myers is no longer with us, but he left us quite a legacy of mm -hmm. uh, how do you do this in natural medicine, mm -hmm. how do you do Wonderful. that, and so Wonderful. forth. Um, and as Dr. Myers found, iodine will, if properly applied, get rid of fibrocystic breast disease 100% mm. of the time. Goodness me. It's really interesting. Mm. And uh, I found Dr. Myers was completely correct. If we apply iodine correctly, nobody needs to have fibrocystic breast mm. disease anymore. Mm. In the course of doing that, mm. we ran some tests, and before and after, and the iodine had made such a difference in the estriol production. Mm, incredible. So, that's one. The second one is cobalt. Uh, that's another essential for life element, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, although just in minute quantities. Mm -hmm. um, that one has to do with retaining estrogen in the body properly. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, it also has to do with retaining testosterone and cortisol and other steroid hormones. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have just a tiny, tiny amount of, of the uh, cobalt present in the liver, then these hormones leak out too much. And so one's body can make a lot of hormone, but it just goes out. Mm -hmm. um, that's a rare situation. Mm -hmm. Not quite very common, but it does come up occasionally. Uh, very fortunately, there is cobalt in the food. Most of us get enough of it there. Mm -hmm. Only a very few need any supplement mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. But again, it helps to retain those hormones. Without mm -hmm. the cobalt, they're excreted to excess. Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes, it's interesting that they're, they're all, it's not just taking a hormone, it's like you say, it's keeping it in the body, making it function properly, so this is all extremely exciting. And getting it to metabolize properly, all that. Yes. Exactly. Thank you, Dr. Ive. So thank you, Dr. Ive. And of course you have an enormous experience, both, both in the research and in the application with real patients, shall I say. Uh, with these therapies. And I wonder, it, the sort of $64 million question is, how do the women do who, the efficacy and the safety and the side effects, who take, how should we say, standard HRT? And does the women who take the bioidentical HRT, what, what sort of differences would you expect to see? The biggest difference is that the standard HRT includes 
not just horse urine estrogen, mm -hmm. which by the way is natural mm -hmm. for horses, mm -hmm. um, but being natural, it is less dangerous than the other component of, of, of uh, standard HRT, which is not progesterone. Mm -hmm. In fact, it gets labeled progestin, which is a wastebasket word for any molecule that sort of looks like progesterone, mm -hmm. but it's not really progesterone. That stuff has turned out to be procarcinogenic. Right. So when people use the horse urine estrogen and the progestin, and by the way, everyone knows it's called Provera, mm -hmm. the predominant one, mm -hmm. the risk of cancers actually goes up. Mm -hmm. And that does not happen with the bioidentical hormones. Nobody's ever, ever found an increased That's risk great. of cancer from them. That's um, now, as far as how people do otherwise, over the long run, if one is putting molecules into the body, including estrogen, progesterone, that are ones that belong there, even if it is after menopause, one is much more likely to get health benefits, um, lowered risk of Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. lowered risk of cardiovascular disease, um, lowered risk of osteoporosis, mm -hmm. and while we're at it, estrogen is extremely good for women's lungs. That's not generally known. It turns out that the Lung Research Institute at Georgetown University has found that estrogen specifically makes the enzyme that exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide go better. So any woman who's an athlete and wants to continue her athletic yeah, yes. athleticism after menopause really needs to be considering, considering estrogen. It not only helps the oxygen exchange, but it also helps maintain the surface mass of the lungs for ladies. And that is not the case for men. Not at all. Testosterone does not do that for men, but estrogen does it for women. And if one goes right back to when one is pregnant, if one is of the right gender, mm -hmm. um, one is not only eating for two, one is breathing for right, two. Right. So it figures that the estrogen is going to increase uh, oxygenation and great, everything. Yeah, it's a great, great yeah. approach, and that's very interesting information. Yeah. I certainly wasn't aware of that. And that one doesn't get out there very much. No, it doesn't. It's very important for lungs. Oh, I should mention then, for those of the ladies who are in the choir, mm -hmm. I hear from choir master after choir master, oh, she got her voice back when she started <laughs> using estrogen. <laughs> Really? That's incredible. Uh, all the time. Going through menopause, the voice changes. Yes. And switching to the guy's side for just a moment. Can't you always tell when a man's 80 by his voice? You can, yes. At least you can yes. tell those who are 80 sometimes by their voices. That's true. When well, you put the estrogen back in for ladies and the testosterone for men, it's just like puberty again. The voice changes back amazing. to what it was to begin with. That's amazing. Very, very interesting. Thank mm. you for that. Thank you. So what I'd like to say, Dr. Wright, in conclusion, is I'd like to quote you, if you don't mind, and I think oh one, of the, <laughs> one of the first times I had the pleasure of meeting you, many moons ago now, and you did say, I remember, that we don't have to be rocket scientists, that we all we have to do is copy nature. Exactly. And it's wonderful that that's exactly what you're doing at your clinic, and you're helping so many people. In fact, I'm, I'm no doubt that through your books and your publications, you're reaching millions of people worldwide with this information. And I feel it's so important because um, as a pharmacologist I'm always saying to people the devil is in the detail. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of women out there who regard HRT as being dangerous. And possibly rightly so with the standard approach because as you've highlighted it does definitely increase the risk yes, of cancer. It does. But not of course with the bioidentical approach. Right. Which is what you're exposing and I think that's wonderful work. So I do encourage everybody out there to go out and get your books so sign up to your newsletter, have a look at your clinic website and learn more for themselves. And I hope our little video today will help do them just that. So thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you. You're getting the word out yourself. Thank you. Thank you.